Hello, dear colleagues. We're going to start this uh, NV meeting. Uh, hello to the few colleagues in the room, and hello to the colleagues uh, uh, remotely. Uh, we will start with the, the exchange of views on, on the climate law. Uh, all of you haven't been uh, tested yet, uh, but you could be tested in parallel uh, of the uh, uh, official uh, debate. So don't hesitate to get connected to the IT service through the app. Uh, we will, of course, start with the adoption of the uh, agenda. I don't think there is any surprise. We move to the chair's announcements, so usual ones with the translation, the one streaming, and maybe one uh, quick comment on uh, the fact that during the, for you to know, uh, the next coordinators meeting that will take place uh, in a few days uh, will discuss the consequence of the announcement of yesterday by the, 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 the commission uh, regarding uh, the uh, recovery uh, package, and, uh, including the health budget line, so that we uh, make the analysis of what it will change for us in our working plan, uh, in what, is, what lies in the remit of the NV committee and so on. So it's, of course, a very important new uh, setting, I would say, and we will make the uh, full analysis uh, next week. So we uh, move now to the uh, uh, official uh, agenda, uh, starting with the exchange of views uh, on the climate law. And I will, of course, give the floor to the rapporteur, Jutta Guterland. If you are with us, Jutta, please. Could you? Uh, Thank you, Chair. I will speak in Swedish. I hope you hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. In English, at least. Okay. Kära kollegor, jag är glad att vi har möjlighet att mötas på det här viset idag för att diskutera detta historiska lagförslag som ska leda Europa till den långsiktiga målsättningen att nå klimatneutralitet senast 2050. I'm sorry, but there's no provision for Swedish today. Jutta, could, could you stop? Because there is no translation. There is no translation at that stage. I don't get. I'm sorry, but we don't we don't have Swedish interpretation today. At that stage, so we are checking. Sorry? Anyway, yeah, apparently it's not first in the Swedish translation. So I'm afraid you're going to have to talk French. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you get my message? Excuse me? Okay, can you hear me, you too? So, you too, the, 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 the Swedish language is not translated. Because apparently... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I don't get any... I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I don't know why I can't hear you. It was fine when we tested it. Okay, so we are going to retest it and to refine it. What is the problem? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
So you do, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So as I told you, there is no Swedish translation. So you have to speak okay. English or or French or German. Okay. Okay. I think <laughs> or it's Irish. French then. Yes, Irish. Yeah. Okay. I will, I will take it in English. Uh, I hope you understand that uh, it's not my speech is in Swedish, so I will translate while I speak. Uh, maybe it will take uh, some more minute, um, one more minute or so, but I really will try uh, to do it. Dear colleagues, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good. Dear colleagues, I'm happy that we are here today and can meet in this way to discuss this historic uh, law that will lead Europe to this goal to reach climate neutrality at latest 2050. The European climate law is the cornerstone in the European Green Deal. This is uh, uh, the law that will make us reach the climate neutrality uh, at latest 2050 and the goal to be uh, climate neutral, uh, neutral uh, is um, uh, a historic thing that will define Europe during the coming decades. This uh, trans uh, transition will mean a change for our society. It will mean that every member state and all the economic sectors will ch need to change. And that means that the citizens also need to change their lifestyle. To this, to be the success and trans um, transition that is successful, we have to do it in a social, ecological and economically a sustainable way. We need to make sure that no one is left behind. The transition of Europe to climate neutrality is not isolated from our effort to reach an equal and just society for everyone. Th these things are linked together and we need also the union and uh, the employers, their participation and their support to reach this. At 2050, for some of us, it can seem like very far away, but to really uh, reach the goal we, uh, in a very safe way, we, we need to start now and we need to work faster than we do today. The latest uh, decade was the hottest that has been uh, measured in the world, and 2019 was actually the warmest year in Europe. The global uh, effort and measures towards uh, the, the climate heating has not been sufficient and not been in, in line with the Paris Agreement. With these uh, growing temperatures and, and also uh, uh, bigger emissions from the greenhouse gas, the Union has no time to lose. The longer we wait to change our society, the, the bigger will the cost be and the challenge to transition in a safe way for everyone. And Europe has the means and also the responsibility to lead this. Therefore, in my report, I will come and I'm coming with a bigger uh, ambition than the Commission's proposal to make sure that the Member State is uh, strong and uh, remains with their commitment to the Paris Agreement. I want them to 2050 accomplish uh, climate neutrality within their territorium. This is about justice, but it's also a way of showing that every member state will go in to win for the, in this transition. If they are too late, they will lose themselves. So this is actually a way of making the member states have be better predictability and also better um, um, possibilities for jobs in the future. To be able to be more predictable in the Union's measures to reduce the emissions, I also suggest that the climate neutrality goal needs to be um, also uh, um, um, exchanged with a goal for the time after 2050 to make sure that um, we are not stopping the work at 2050. 
At 2050, as I said, it's in the future, but to make sure that the EU at the latest 2050 reach climate neutrality and make sure that we are um, faithful to the Paris Agreement, we need the climate goal to reduce also faster to 2030 and 2040. These goals need to work both as milestones and also to evaluate where we are at that point. Um, Europe needs to fulfill Paris Agreement, I said it before, but in my work as the rapporteur, I'm very clear we need to stick to science. Therefore, I'm saying that the EU climate mold for 2030 needs to be tougher and needs to be 65%. If you look at the UN uh, Environmental Programme Emission Gap Report 2019, we have to reduce the emissions with 7.6% per year and start now to be faithful to the 1.5 degree in the Paris Agreement. And even if you don't look at, at the uh, justice questions uh, or how much we emit per capita uh, or our history and our responsibility for our history in Europe, it means that for EU we need to reduce by 68% 20 30 if you compare it to 1990s level. So to you who think I'm too ambition, look at that figure. The Commission needs also in good time look at and uh, propose a, a target for 2040. And uh, I want you to have an impact assessment on that, but it needs to be, of course, in between 80 and 85 percent. I see these goals as complement also to the, uh, to the trajectory that the Commission has proposed. I don't think the Commission's proposal to have this trajectory by delegated act is suitable or in line with the treaty. So to make sure that we have uh, the full um, involvement from the citizens and in a democratic way, we need to do this together with the European Parliament and the Council as it should. I want to come back to science. For the EU climate work, if it should be uh, in line with science and really listen to the results, and I believe all citizens of today would want that, we see that uh, we have a um, need to evaluate uh, how we are working also on in the EU level. I don't want to challenge the IPCC's very good work. I really, uh, we had enormous help from, from that. I don't want something similar on the EU level, but I think we need a panel with experts who can evaluate what we are doing on the EU level because we are the leaders here. We are going to transist enormously in Europe. We need science to, to check on that. Uh, I will look at the possibilities to make it even more clear than my report through the amendments so that you don't think that that's, it's challenging the IPCC, but we need to evaluate on the EU level. I also suggest that we should have a carbon budget this is to make sure that we have every measure on the climate um, policy uh, that is in line with uh, the Paris Agreement and also make sure that it's fair between the sectors, between the member states and that we have a mathematical way of working here. So this is a proposal that I want the Commission to work on. In the end, I would like to say a few words about all sectors in the society. Everyone needs to contribute in this work. If we are going to make this transition, we need every sector to contribute. And I would like them to have a roadmap in every sector who describes when and how, at the le latest 2050, this sector can reduce its emission and be close to zero. And also identify the hinder, the problems that they see and the opportunities. Some sectors have especially a responsibility to reduce their emissions faster. I think about aviation and maritime sector who has big global emissions and if you look at the maritime sector they are today the only sector who doesn't have uh, the union 
um, legislation to reduce their emissions. And therefore, uh, they actually are going in the future to emit more and more. And 2050, they can reach 86% over 98 uh, 1990s level that is huge they need to reduce faster in the end uh, to find uh, to uh, to say my final words i'm very much looking forward to listen to my colleagues and their reactions to my report i look forward to work together with you to find good compromise and strong compromise during these weeks in the summer so that we as a parliament can be really progressive and strong in our common work to reach a climate law that is a historic for Europe, from the coal and steel in union to climate neutral Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jutta. Uh, so I'm going to give the floor to the uh, shadows. Uh, just to warn you, so we open as well the list for the catch the eye that will happen after the uh, shadows uh, speaking time. So uh, don't hesitate to raise your button if you are uh, remotely participating or raise your hand here in the room. So I give the floor to Merit McGuinness for the EPP. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, firstly, I want to thank Jutta Gutteland for her work and indeed for the way she has worked because we have had lots of engagement, not physically present engagement, but very a, a good remote engagement. And I want to say that I very much appreciate that. I woke up this morning to the news telling me what I perhaps knew, that there was, has been an unprecedented shock to the Irish economy because of COVID-19, the worst economic uh, hit we've ever taken with unemployment likely to be uh, rising over 17%. Um, and I, I use those uh, opening words to say that um, as a result of pan the pandemic, we have a reduction in emissions. And really none of us want an unprecedented shock to reduce emissions. We want to plan our target for climate neutrality by 2050. And we have to do that and we have to do it in order to achieve uh, our goals. So if we don't want a shock to cause the problem, we have to see how we get from here uh, to the, at this point towards 2050. We know that the Commission will have an impact assessment um, to give us a guide for the 2030 target. And I think that impact assessment is important. And perhaps, Chairman, it might be useful for the Committee to look at trying to get this information as soon as possible in order to work with the timelines uh, that we all are trying to um, reach out to because that will help us in guiding us not just in 2030 but onwards. And I'm also expected that the Commission will take account of the current situation uh, in the impact assessment which we await. I agree that everyone needs to get on board, not just countries but communities and societies. And I would also say that many are beginning in their own way to do that. For example, communities coming together to retrofit homes, doing it for those who are vulnerable. Because one of the realities is that fossil fuels is the f fuel of many people who have low incomes. And we are conscious that this transition must be just. I'd also remark that yesterday the President of the Commission uh, made a point about the investments in the recovery plan going towards our green agenda, the Green Deal um, investments to make us uh, climate neutral. And I think that makes our work even more important and more pertinent. And we hope those investments will go in the right direction. And we know there is a big discussion to be had uh, in relation to that. So yes, this is the cornerstone of the Green Deal. Um, and depending on how the impact assessment works out, we will have a trajectory towards 2050. We do have to start now and we do have to work fast. The issue of uh, member state targets has been discussed within member states and amongst ourselves. And I think we can accept that we want everybody to be ambitious so that member states can reach individually a climate neutrality, at least work, work to achieve that, even though we know some member states are starting at different positions in the trajectory. Um, in relation to the um, science, I've listened well in relation to the science, and, and it is important to us. It's why uh, we are uh, we looking out and working towards the climate neutrality target 
uh, of 2050. And I think where there might be some differences is in the stages uh, of how we get there. But you are right, Jutta, the time is very short. I've said in our informal conversations, I'm not sure I'll be around by 2050, but I hope I do good work for those who will be around. And I think we are conscious in our committee this morning that the work we are doing now is for the future. It's for our children and their children to make sure that they have a planet uh, that they can live on. And if anything, um, this pandemic has taught us the value of our our planet, the, the uh, biodiversity, we've had time to listen and watch and to understand what is happening all around us. So perhaps the, the, um, the atmosphere is good for us to talk about climate and the changes that will be required. Um, and if I haven't already mentioned, I do think it's important that yesterday the um, recovery plan talks about a higher budget for that just transition. Um, because there are communities who feel vulnerable um, and are threatened by uh, what we are trying to do because it will impact them harder than others. And I think we, um, as uh, Shadows and as a Rapporteur, are sensitive to that concerns that exist uh, amongst um, cer certain sections of our community. So let me just wrap up by saying that um, I welcome the uh, report of the Rapporteur. There are areas where we are in agreement and there are some areas where we will have to work towards finding a compromise. There is no disagreement about the 2050 uh, target. And I think that that is what accepted widely by all of us, that that is our, our goal. If we can do it earlier, I think that would be absolutely vital. Um, uh, and I do think that we you know, should push for people working as hard as they can and as fast as they can, also bearing in mind the economic issues and the just transition. Um, I do think that when we speak about climate, we talk about emissions and we, we do need to talk about sinks. And I think that is an issue that perhaps we could have um, more engagement on to see our capacity for um, Mayor Ed, sequestration. Uh, and lastly, sorry, lastly, just to say um, uh, technology. We would hope that the, the innovations will help us reach that target as well as the efforts we are making currently. Apologies, I didn't see the clock. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, just as a reminder, the shadows are supposed to have three minutes. I think it's the only exchange of views we have publicly, so I allow them a bit more time. But if you all took, uh, or take, sorry, uh, five or six minutes, there will be no space for uh, catch the eye. Just for you to know. Uh, Neil Storvals for Renew. Uh, thank you, Pascal. And I start in Swedish, even uh, without uh, the translation, because it goes directly to Jutte. Tack så mycket Jutte för ett jättegott arbete. Jag tror att du har gjort det ganska mycket lättare för oss genom att göra ett gediget grundarbete. So that's the Swedish speaking part. Uh, and um, then I go to the, to the basic issues there. The first basic issue is, of course, the target for 2030. I tend to be very pragmatic at this point. I think we need a broad majority, and if that broad majority uh, is setting for at least 55%, I think that's where the direction where we should go. Not go into too much tactics, because that probably doesn't always pay off. But uh, at the same time, I'm very, very much aware, and Jutta said it in her in introductory speech, that that 55% uh, isn't actually in, in line with uh, the Paris Agreement, which uh, uh, gives us uh, the second issue, and that's the issue of, of 2040. If we don't do it uh, good enough 20, uh, 2030, then we need to have a more... Uh, a, a, a more, uh, a better working uh, uh, goal or target for for 2040, and we need to have something saying uh, where we should land after 2050. We know, uh, or we think we know, that this part was actually excluded from the Commission's proposal in the very last minutes of of of, of the of the, of the work there. Uh, uh, what we are looking for very much here in this uh, in this law is using a carbon budget for uh, to reach the goal. We think that the carbon budget is uh, actually a very good tool uh, for the companies to understand where they are going in the long run, 
And uh, at the same time, we know that the carbon budget is not as easy as it sometimes seems on the international arena. Uh, when this issue was uh, taken up uh, uh, in the meetings before the Paris Agreement or the Paris COP2021, 20, uh, there was a big fight about who should take part of which uh, part of the CO2 in the atmosphere. And you have all the sins from history coming up there. So what we are looking for is what we call a tentative carbon budget as a toolbox uh, for politicians and for companies to, to accomplish what must be accomplished. Uh, we are, and, and what probably the best part of this is that we could uh, also construct a trajectory down to 2050 by using the, the carbon budget. And now I see I have three seconds left. So thank you. I'll try to keep my time. Thanks. Impressive. Thank you for this right standard. Uh, for the time wise, I mean. So uh, for ID, Sylvia Limer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Gestern wurde im Parlament wieder heftig über die. Yesterday, we had a lively discussion about the post corona rescue funds. And according to the Commission proposal, it will be 750 billion, which will be made available for the economy post corona virus. But no one will know quite what the impact of this crisis will be in society. Why, and why do I start with this? Because it's only a resilient society that will be able to really implement climate protection. Now, I think, to put it bluntly, you have to be able to afford climate protection. Now, this kind of um, strict climate protection is something that no one can afford today. And for the politicians are saying that you have to change your lifestyle as is currently happening you know i think it's that would be the only honest approach because everything else would be just sort of cheating people into thinking that some sort of european climate law will by magic sort of conjure up a new climate neutral reality for people now if that were really the case then why would it take years of financing for this climate transition to bring it about. In the past, there was a 250 billion annual um, cost estimated to the reduction of, um, of emissions. And now we have a much more ambitious target for reduction. And we have to add this on to the rescue package and an economy that's ground to a halt. So that's the very last thing we need right now. So let me be very clear. The European Parliament is in Home Office, the Commission too, and now everything is being done to push through this climate law um, as quickly as possible, which I think is scandalous. It seems to be some sort of bad joke being played by uh, green fanatics on wider society, um, blind to all the economic ind indicators and realities that we're facing. It's dangerous, if you ask me, and it's dangerous for w citizens at large. So very briefly on the contents of the European climate law. Let me tell you what I think of it. I think it's nonsense. Okay, it's short. So um, we move to Michael Bloss for the Greens. Um, dear colleagues, um, dear Jutta, thank you very much for your great work. Um, when the climate law was presented, Greta Thunberg spoke of the draft from the Commission as surrender, and I think this proposal is the opposite. It speaks the language of yes, we can. And the draft law it follows two important principles. It aligns the climate law to the Paris Agreement and it follows the science. Reducing CO2 emissions by 65% is a scientific imperative and it's not overburdening the EU. The EU 
UN emissions gap report says that such reductions are needed for everyone in order to have the possibility to reach 1.5 degrees. The overall CO2 budget is, needed, is a needed update for the EU climate policy. It allows us to be precise in setting our target. What matters for the climate is how much CO2 is in the atmosphere and not far away climate neutrality dates. And studies show that an independent scientific board is a key factor for a successful climate law in member states. So introducing it on the European level is key and will also make our climate law a success. Citizens and the coming generations have a right to a healthy and stable climate and need to get access to claim this. As much as they have a right that we do what we promised, like phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and honoring the climate emergency by aligning the MMF proposal of yesterday to the net zero emission objective. So we have to treat the crisis like a crisis. And I think the next generation of the EU will thank us for this. So let's make this, uh, this legislation a piece where Europe shows global leadership and I and my group will work tirelessly together with all of you to make it a success story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for ECR, Anna Zeljewska. Hello. It works. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much, Jutta. Thank you. Uh, to all my colleagues with whom I was in contact, uh, thanks uh, to the assistants as well, we were uh, working together very hard to analyze this climate uh, law. We are at a cross crosswords, we are in a historical moment uh, when this climate law is being adopted. We are also in a, uh, at a crosswords because of the pandemic. Uh, we have to present our citizens with a very clear uh, plan, together with a clear financial analysis uh, showing the way out of the crisis. We also have to present analysis on the impact of climate law in different member states. Failing this, uh, the citizens are um, going to show doubts and they are not going to follow us. We have to show that we stand united, that we stand together, that solidarity is our crucial value and that the European Union is an added value. So my suggestion is to work further on the climate law, but we also have to demand uh, very concrete numbers, uh, very concrete financial analysis. So, The climate law. It's, it's okay. Can go ahead. It's okay. Yeah. The climate law has to include several aspects. First of all, uh, like the legal service has already uh, have already spoken, we cannot give up uh, the uh, competences of the European Parliament and member states to the uh, European Commission. We are talking about the trajectory. This cannot be decided upon by delegated acts. Uh, and at the same time, when we are talking about uh, zero net emissions in the European Union, we have to remember uh, about the decisions uh, of the Council in December, when we are not talking about individual member states, but we're talking about the whole of the European Union. 
at the same time, before we vote and before, before we go into the nitty gritty, we want to see the impact assessment uh, analysis. We want to see how the European Commission is calculating the emissions and we want member states to be involved at every single step of the way. We want to be together, we want to, con to conduct a dialogue, but we also have to remember about the needs of our citizens and economy. We have to be credible. So um, we cannot uh, um, let the economy or and uh, the uh, industry flee to China. Uh, let's look at Volvo. Uh, I'm talking to you, Tay. You know, uh, mm, the production moved uh, elsewhere. I think the pandemic shows us very clearly that we have to remember about economy as well. Thank you. Uh, the last uh, shadow is Sylvia Modig for the GUE. Ms. Modig, can you press the speak button, please? Can yes. You hear me now? yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Thank you, everybody, for your input. Uh, I want to thank, uh, start off with thanking uh, Jutta Guteland for an excellent job. Uh, you have really improved the Commission's proposal in many ways. The draft report is going in a more ambitious way and in a better way in many, many um, uh, ways. Uh, also, I want to thank you for the way you have worked on this very openly and in a very inclusive way and, and being in open contact with all the other shadows. That is highly appreciated. Uh, the climate law is, is a key element of the Green Deal. It could be said that this will define if the Green Deal will succeed or not, because this is the law where we set into law the target of being climate neutral in 2050. And I think that uh, Jutte's uh, proposal is really taking us in that way, that if we follow the path Jutte has now opened for us, we are closer to being climate neutral in 2050. It's very good ambition to raise aviation and maritime sectors also, uh, lift them up in this draft report. And it's also a very good the sectoral approach, as we have so much conversation about um, it should have been done in this sector, it can be done more efficiently or more cheaply in another sector. So this uh, puts the pressure within each sector to find the most efficient measures to, to reach the targets. Uh, a target for 2030 is needed. Uh, and it's very good that the ambition is raised, because for those who say that 55 is enough for them, I must remind you, it's not in line with Paris. So if we want to uh, respect the Paris Agreement, which we have signed, we have to be more ambitious. And that's why also the advisory board is a very good idea, as we cannot make decisions that contradict with science. And that's why we need some kind of independent and autonomous body who will measure the progress, measure the decisions made to see that we are in line with the Paris Agreement. And I think Mrs. Kutelan has written it quite well in the draft report about the advisory board. It just says it has to be independent and autonomous, and it leaves open in many ways how it could work. Uh, I'm also happy that Jutte has raised the question of, of of uh, social justice, because if we are to succeed with the climate work, we, nobody can be left behind. Whether it's individuals, whether it's the workers, whether it's societies, whether it's member states, this has to be done in a socially just way. Otherwise, we cannot succeed because we need everybody with us. And therefore, the Just Transition Fund is an extremely important tool, and whether that needs to be strengthened is another discussion we need to have. Why the 2030 target is so important and why it's important that it's ambitious enough is especially for the companies. We need a predictable view for companies uh, to make investments and know what will the political decisions be in the coming years. 
because we cannot afford to lose any investments. We need investments in, in clean energy, we need investments in, in research, in new innovations, and we cannot afford to lose any investments. And therefore, it is uh, in the benefit of the member states and of the companies that we now set ambitious enough targets and we set the 2030 and the 2040 um, uh, targets. And to conclude, Pascal, we also have to understand all the time that when we talk about being climate neutral, we have to understand that that doesn't mean only emission reduction. That also means that the sinks has to be in balance with the emissions. And therefore, no emission reduction number is enough if we don't take care of the sinks at the same time. And this is not uh, an, an easy mathematic uh, 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 pro uh, calculation to do when exactly are the things uh, at the right size and th that's why it's so important that we have a strong reliable scientific advice with us all the time so we don't make any any decisions that are that contradict with the scientific advice thank you Jutte, very much for your work and our group uh, is looking forward to continuing working with you and trying to find majorities and compromises where it is possible but we are not uh, willing to compromise on the level of ambition and we are not uh, willing to compromise on not being on track with the Paris Agreement. Thank you. So uh, for the Catch the Eye session I have 13 speakers and I will ask you kindly but firmly to comply with the one minute slot otherwise we will never make it and then we have the Commission and then you two, uh, to conclude this first debate. So, uh, starting with the EPP, Peter Lise. Mr. Lise, can you press the speak button to make the connection, please? Once again, thank you, sir. No, we can't. We can't hear you, Peter. Minute is over. So we, we move to Mr. Bazescu for the EPP, and then we will get back to, to Peter. Thank you, sir. If this law will be adopted as it is currently, most probably we will have a discretionary power to the Commission, and I consider it a big mistake. On the end, in order to have a success, must be a partnership between Commission and the Member State. A roadmap must be uh, correlated with the actions, the financial resources, and social problems which can happen if, when we will apply such programs. In the same time, I like to draw the attention of all of you, and I kindly invite you to visit Romania. We make this exercise on the first decade of this century, and it's a disaster. The area is called Giu Valley. With the World Bank, we start to close the, mine, the mines, and now no working places, no security on the uh, closed mines and so on. We have an example. We can see together what means an uncorrelated program. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the SND, Cesar Luena. Sí. Gracias, Peter. In primer lugar. Thank you, Peter. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you to, uh, for the excellent uh, report she's just uh, presented. Just one brief comment 
climate is the third uh, cause of the loss of biodiversity and the uh, natural economic systems and this increases the uh, warming of the atmosphere so this link between biodiversity uh, in the climate is essential the important role uh, the forests play in uh, climate change uh, needs to be included in the law as well. But we need to see the restoration of ecosystems and uh, included uh, so that uh, the uh, member states can adapt to a warmer climate in the future because it's inevitable. The sound is extremely difficult to, to make out. We need to have scientific evaluation. We want to make sure that we have more scientific evidence uh, other than the one we had in 2019. Mr. Archik, can you press the speak button, please? Oh, good morning. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, first of all, to Ite for uh, a really great work on the report and a great collaboration uh, with the groups that really uh, I'm very happy to see this on such an important piece of uh, legislation. Now, uh, first of all, I would like to attach a uh, few words to the costs and the whole uh, impact report. We talk about the impacts of the reduction of emissions, yet what we need to talk about is also the impacts of climate change if it goes about two degrees. And I think this is something which uh, is often forgotten. We need to have a carbon budget, but it, I admit that it's really something hard to take into account when we have uh, a global economy. Uh, so we need to look at the carbon burden adjustment as being part of it and combining it, in my view, also uh, with the overall reduction target. And last but not least, I think we need to look also not only at the 2030 and 2040 target, but ideally also intermediate targets for 25. Thank you. Thank you. For the Greens, Jutta Paulus. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Jutta, for this great work which you have done. And um, I really would like to point out that this work is not only for our children and grandchildren, because climate change already impacts the life of European citizens today. Um, we have this this place in Romania where we have actually the formation of a desert due to climate change. In my home country, Germany, we see dying forests due to the drought, which is of course attributed to climate change. In the Netherlands, the rising sea level makes um, survival of the citizens living so close to the coast ever more difficult. And if the current COVID crisis has taught us something, then it is that nature does not bargain and that science cannot be changed through negotiations. And that's why um, it's so important that you really take into account the carbon budget, because this will make it possible that we actually tackle climate change on a scientific base. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great Miguelas. Thanks very much, Chair. And uh, thank you, Jutta. Uh, your, your work is excellent. Um, listen, the 65% reduction by 2030 is based on the UN Emissions Gap Report, and that is calling for 7.6% year on year, and uh, that has to be absolutely vital. Now, uh, climate neutrality uh, is a, can be a dangerous word too. Uh, it does give permission to the fossil fuel industry to continue to pollute, and uh, we really should be working for real zero emissions. And the Rapporteur to our credit also introduces a 2040 target of 80 to 85% reduction by 
by 2040 compared to 1990. Now, uh, again, uh, we're looking for real zero emissions uh, targets of where we should be going. And uh, listen, people think that we can't afford this. Uh, I would say that we absolutely cannot afford not to do this. And the countries, some countries will find it a lot more difficult and they will have to get more help. It will have to be done in a just way. Thank you. Thank you. For non-attached, Eleonora Evi. Can you press the speak button, please? Eh no, la proposta della relatrice supporta in, in pieno la proposta. We'd like to fully support the rapporteur's uh, aim to in increase uh, the aims to 65% uh, by 2030, because that's what science says. Uh, I would have uh, liked to see the EU reach the uh, zero net rates before 2050. In fact, uh, colleagues, uh, there's a recent study from Solar Power Europe, uh, together with Lute University, which shows uh, how uh, zero emissions uh, Europe is possible by 2040. Uh, thanks to uh, an energy system which is highly efficient, uh, so the energy efficiency first principle, and it's based solely on renewable energy, on the democratization of the centralization of all of the systems without using carbon sinks, nuclear energy, or natural gas, or other fossil fuels. This is the basis we need to follow, and we shouldn't uh, continue to uh, twist around this, because otherwise uh, this will be more expensive in terms of uh, the economy and indeed the climate. Thank you. Thank you. For the EPP, back to Peter Lise. So, now it works. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jutta. Yeah, the climate law is indeed historic. It was the first point in Ursula von der Leyen's speech last year, and the EPP fully supports the climate law, and we support the proposal of the Commission. And I think it's already a big achievement of all those that work for the climate, that we have a broad consensus on climate neutrality, and that we have a broad consensus also on increasing the target for 2030. Two years ago, it was not possible, and the world has changed also here in the European Parliament. And we support also a lot of the elements of Jutta's report, but we cannot hide the disagreement on the 2030 target. 65% is far too much, and it will never get any consensus also in the Council. Even going to 50% or to 55, as the Commission proposed, is ambitious. We are 20% above the emissions of 1990. In 30 years, 20%. Another 30% in only 10 years is ambitious, and let's focus on the Commission proposal and let's not overstretch it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for SND, Mohamed Chain. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's good to be here uh, back in Brussels. First, I want to congratulate our rapporteur Yeta on her excellent work. And I think she added many essential things to the climate law. Most things uh, me as a member of SD can agree on. For example, a more ambitious 2030 emission target aligned with the science, a carbon budget, a sectoral approach, and scientific body, and very important transparency so people can see what we base our decisions on. I will support the 65% that Cheta put in her uh, report. Um, dear colleagues of this committee, I ask of you all to be brave and keep the ambitions high even in this difficult COVID-19 times. No, especially during this COVID-19 times. The Corona Recovery Package would hel will help countries and companies invest in green technologies and together with the do no harm principle will reshape our economy. Let's make sure that we as members from the MV Committee that we have an ambitious forward-looking Parliament's position on the climate law. Let's seize this moment to flatten the climate curve. Thank you. Takieta. 
Thank you. For Renew, Catherine Chabot. Merci, Président. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. I'd like to thank the rapporteur for her excellent work. And I'd like to express my support for the position that she set out on climate neutrality by member state and with uh, underpinned by the spirit of solidarity, which I think should guide climate law. And I think the 2050 uh, objective I can support too. Now, on 2030, I think we need to ask ourselves whether we need to boost our ambition there and move to 65% uh, or perhaps abandon the thought of neutrality by 2050. I think 55% uh, should be the minimum, uh, though. Now, I don't know if we need a European group of experts. I think the IPCC is quite able to do this work. And we need to bear in mind the mar maritime aspect as well. Now, I think we need to talk about energy um, sobriety and ecosystems. We need to use carbon sinks more and allow um, land-based and marine ecosystems to do their work to, the, to mitigate uh, this climate challenge. And I think it's in times of crisis that humans show the greatest ingenuity and capacity to innovate, so we should give room to businesses and citizens to do this. There is significant interference in SND Barbara Moretti. Maradena Alessandra. <laughs> thank you, Chair. First of all, thank you to Gitte for your great work. It is uh, of paramount importance to act uh, uh, swiftly since uh, any delay will compromise the achievement of the objective for the EU to become climate neutral by 2050. We are living in difficult times, uh, but uh, we cannot allow the COVID crisis to be used uh, as a pretext uh, to delay the implementation of the Green Deal and the climate law. The recovery will be successful only if it will be a green one. As a shadow rapporteur for the TRAN opinion, I think it will be important to further focus on the transport sector, which is one of the largest emitters in the EU. The aviation and maritime sectors, in particular, are big emitters, and in 2017 they were responsible for the largest percentage increase in greenhouse gas emission. We should, of course, push for a very ambitious 2030 reduction target and for a 2040 indicative one and ensure that all MS reach net zero emissions within their territory by 2050 at the least. Thank you. Thank you. For Renew, Andreas Gluck. Thank you, Pascal. Dear colleagues, first of all, I want to say that I really believe that um, the Green Deal um, is a huge opportunity for us as a European Union, but just if you approach the problem and the challenge in the right way. Um, so first of all, let me say um, every sector has to participate, sure, um, but please let's take into account that maybe it is good if we keep some kind of flexibility. So for example, if one sector is uh, over-fulfilling a goal, maybe another sector um, has problems with it, so we need some kind of, um, of flexibility. Then let's come to the 2030 target. Um, I really do believe that we as a parliament should be a reliable partner to council and also to the commission. And we just decided on 55% um, in February. So if we change um, the um, 55 degrees into 65 degrees, we will probably, it will probably not be seen that we are a re reliable partner. And after what Peter Lise has said, um, we should all seek for a broad majority on this. Um, if we go on 65% for the 2030 target, we really risk a broad majority. Last point, um, I believe we have to mention things uh, in this climate law 
our best tools we already got. So, for example, the European trade system for CO2. We have to mention this. This has to be a cornerstone of our climate um, policy also for future times, and we have to strengthen this very worthful tool we already have. Thank you. Thank you. The last two speakers from SND, Rafi Lopez. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much to the reporter, Jutta. You did an uh, excellent uh, um, report and draft. My point is, um, first of all, thank you for um, reinforcing uh, the role of the parliament in this process, um, the social dimension, and obviously the ambition uh, of this process. But, uh, especially, I would want to underline the contribution of the parliament with this uh, draft that uh, could be uh, especially in the control of this process and with three elements, the sectorial roadmap, um, the group of experts and obviously the union carbon uh, budget. Uh, because to make it happen, uh, the decarbonization of our economy, we need a control uh, and especially after resources. Um, but uh, we will ensure. Um, but these three elements could be um, key contributions of the Parliament in this process to, to control uh, the next uh, years and the roadmap of the decarbonization of our economy. Thank you very much for the report. Thank you. So I will give the floor now to Alexander Vandroa. He's not part of the SND group yet, but uh, he uh, wanted to have the floor because there was no ECR speaker before in the uh, Catch the Eye session. So, Alexander, to you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, the chairman. Hello, everybody. Let me start with this. I agree with 2050 climate neutrality target, but those proposals which uh, Rapporteur presented and goes beyond the Commission proposal, I think it's not a prescription how to reach this target or to save the planet, but rather a prescription to destroy the EU. I have heard a lot about science, but uh, uh, also uh, a lot about uh, about the need to change the society or the human nature, which is rather a religion. Science operates with the doubts, operates with the numbers. We don't have any impact assessment yet, so uh, I do not see any uh, uh, scientific reason to raise the target for 2030, as is uh, proposed. I see that those carbon budget and sectorial roadmaps as a prescription for a bureaucratic mess. Yesterday, I had a phone call with, uh, with the businesses of Europe uh, from this region, and they asked me whether we are crazy in the EP. So this is the reaction. So I urge the reporter to reconsider this kind of a hardline approach, which we cannot support. Thank you. So the last speaker is Peter Vitanov from SND. Thank you, Chair. First, allow me to thank Yuta for her great uh, job and the balanced report. Now, the European climate policy should not only achieve uh, climate neutral uh, Europe by 2050, but also need to design the path toward it. This includes mobilizing appropriate financial resources to enable the necessary investments, because our ambitions must be proportional to resources we have or we envisage. That's why I welcome the idea uh, of establishing a roadmap describing how it can reduce emissions proposed by the rapporteur. Now, particular consideration must be given to the social dimension of the transition, including through employment opportunities, as well as the challenges of the energy sector. The climate neutrality objective should be achieved in a way that preserves union compatibility, competitiveness, I'm sorry, including by developing WTO a compatible carbon border adjustment mechanism and renegotiating the Energy Charter Treaty to promote sustainable energy investments. And last but not least, 
Uh, as soon as possible, we need a compre comprehensive impact assessment, which includes COVID-19 crisis aftermath. Uh, and taking into account its analysis of the integrated national energy and climate plans submitted to the Commission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we uh, move to the Commission now for five minutes. Please we stick to the five minutes. I will have to make it... Thank you very much, Chair. We'll try also to, to be a, a bit faster, if I can. From, uh, from our side, uh, again, thank you very much to the rapporteur and to all of you who have contributed to this debate. We, we certainly look forward to working with, uh, with all of you in, in translating this proposal into uh, a hard piece of legislation that will have a, a strategic significance in guiding uh, our climate action uh, and giving the, 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 the direction for the, for the Green Deal. Uh, as the President said, we're, of course, we're all busy thinking and acting on climate change. There is, on COVID-19, there is no vaccine against climate change, and so this remains very high on the Commission priority. Um, on the different topics mentioned, I, I will just uh, give you a little bit of reaction or explanation of where we were coming from uh, in our proposal. Uh, first of all, the level of ambition for 2050 climate neutrality. Uh, as we were, we were all talking, we go back to the science. We look at the IPPC special report on 1.5 that tells us that to, to try to arrive at limiting climate change at 1.5, uh, the world as a whole should be around net zero, around 2070. And so we think that uh, a contribution from Europe aiming at climate neutrality by 2050 is still uh, an important contribution that we would do to the atmosphere and to international cooperation uh, on climate change. Many of you talked about uh, individual targets uh, for member states to each arrive at 2050 uh, as an individual obligation. As you know, in our proposal, we proposed uh, that the 2050 target is a uh, global target for the Union is a union-wide target to which all member states have an obligation to contribute to it and to take steps to it, but we will achieve it as a union. There are different reasons for this. One, of course, as we followed uh, what uh, was already the guidance from the European Council in December, what also was in the previous reports of the European Parliament on 2050 as an EU objective. There is also some element of solidarity and efficiency. We are a union of member states, each with different economies, different natural situations. There is a little bit of flexibility that uh, can be gained by working together. What matters in the end is where the big emissions are and not the bo our internal borders between these emissions. Already now, uh, under our existing legislation, member states can help each other uh, with credits, for example. This happened several times with different member states who help each other achieve the targets by leveraging the different uh, assets that they have in their own particular condition. Um, on the 2030 target, as you know, we are working on our impact assessment. This remains uh, an important priority, and we will deliver it uh, by September. Again, uh, we think that uh, the range indicated at present by the Lion is a very ambitious range, uh, and is still a very important contribution that uh, Europe could do uh, to climate change. Coming back a little bit uh, to the science, uh, we are not uh, convinced of the added value of creating a European uh, scientific advisory body on climate change science. We uh, all uh, think very highly of the IPPC. Uh, we think that uh, they're doing an excellent work, also thanks to many European scientists who work on it, in both clarifying the science and also helping us as policymakers understanding what are the consequences uh, of this science. So we use this already very much as the scientific basis of our proposal. And I know also, since everybody's mentioning different scientific reports, also all of you in your work, you already take this into account. We as Commission also finance a lot of science in climate change through our Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe product uh, programs. We have scientific advisors. For example, you see that when we did the long-term strategy, this was accompanied uh, by a high-level uh, independent scientific report. And then on top of this, there is the European Environmental Agency, which is already is monitoring greenhouse gases, presenting annual reports, looking at the gap in implementation, and AEA itself has a scientific body. All this to say that while we are hesitant uh, on, on this proposal, it's not because we don't like science, it's because we think we're already uh, taking it very much into account in our policy making. And indeed, one other concern uh, outside us would be 
uh, what does it mean for the IPPC to create an EPPC? Would, uh, would European science then all work in the European body? Would we have then uh, to divide who goes where? And of course, our European scientists will be uh, truthful scientists, but what would we do if then we see a proliferation of scientific bodies in other countries? Uh, and then using this regional scientific body to then spin different policy views of the scientific consequences. On the carbon budget, the Vice President already mentioned that uh, our policy is based on, uh, on emission reductions. What is important is that we get there at climate neutrality in the end, and very finally, of course, just transition is very, very important. The climate law is just a piece of the puzzle. With the proposals of yesterday, we put the money where our mouth is, and also all together, I think we are looking both at the regulatory context, but also at giving us the means of achieving this transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you used your five minutes slot. So, uh, back to you two for two minutes for your concluding remarks. Thank you, Cher. Thank you, Shadows. Thank you, members. Thank you, Commission. And uh, thank you all for this uh, discussion that we have had this morning, the discussion we had this morning. I believe uh, this work to reach climate neutrality for Europe is not a one man work, it's not a one woman work, it's a work we need to accomplish together. And I believe the discussion that we had today gave us a very good uh, starting point to do this important travel to make sure that we everyone contributes with the best ideas, with the best spirit of compromise and help each other to make sure that the EU climate law will be successful. We have a big uh, road ahead of us, I know that, both this year, but then also for Europe to reach climate neutrality. It is a historic change that needs to come, and we need to start this in an ambitious way and make sure that we reduce emissions faster than the EU has done before and also faster than the proposal that we have on the, on the table at this moment. But I find during this morning that there is a big support to do this and do this in a just way for equality, just transition. I heard many of you mention how important it is for you that we support member states, that we support citizens, and that we make sure that no one is left behind. I also find big support to do this with more ambition. Many of you point out that you would like to see more than what uh, was on the table before. You would like to see, as I do, concrete proposals to make sure everything to be responsible and to reduce emission faster. I also find big support for science. And that is what is making me very happy today. Uh, many of you point out how important it is to listen to science and also have you have and I have proposals that are in line with what science is suggesting, but also how we can involve the scientists in Europe and in our work. Thank you for that. This is a historic moment. It's an historic start. I'm very grateful for today. I believe that we will work hard this summer. We will make sure that uh, the Environmental Committee is co committed to do this work together and that we will have the good result in September when we vote in the NV Committee. Thank you so much, Cher, and thank you to all who contributed today. Thank you. Thank you, you too. So, as a reminder, the deadline for amendments is June 3rd, uh, 11, I guess it's a.m. Uh, vote in NV is September 10th, and the vote in plenary is uh, uh, the first session of October. It's an agreed timeline, timetable with the other committees, so it will not be changed. Um, 